Good morning and welcome to another edition of Our Town here on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. My name is Darren Swenson. Our Town, as always, brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust. A little later on in the program, we'll talk to Decora School Superintendent Tim Cronin. We'll also talk to Decora City Manager Travis Gedkin, get updates on what's going on with the Decora Community School District as well as the City of Decora. We'll be joined by Jason Passmore. He is with the Cresco Chamber of Commerce and Howard County Economic Development. A nice event, a fun event uh, coming next Monday and Tuesday to the historic uh, Cresco Theater. The Duel, which is a six-part docu-series on the 1986 Iowa State Wrestling Duel. Uh, we'll be uh, coming to Cresco uh, next uh, week. We'll get all the details about that uh, with uh, Jason Passmore, but we're going to kick off the show uh Previewing a, a very special event uh, coming up uh, this Saturday at the Preston, Minnesota Veterans Cemetery. Rob Gross, our friend uh, from the Preston uh, Veterans uh, Cemetery, uh, will be joining us to tell us about the wreath laying ceremony uh, this uh, Saturday. Rob uh, joins us to uh, be our leadoff man here on Our Town. It's brought to you by Decora Bank and Trust, and you're listening to it on 94.9 and 99.1 The River. Having a conversation this morning with Rob Gross. He is with the Minnesota State Department of Veterans Affairs. And coming up uh, this Saturday, there is a honor wreath ceremony taking place at the Veterans uh, Ceremony or the Veterans Cemetery, I should say, in uh, Preston. Rob, uh, as we talk to you uh, about a lot of these events, uh, sounds like a, a very emotional, very uh, special day uh, coming up on Saturday. What does the day all entail? Um, again, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today, Darren. Um, it, you're absolutely right. It is a very emotional day, um, both celebratory and from a memorial standpoint for families. So the, the basis of it is placing a wreath, um, allowing families the opportunity and, and visitors and guests and volunteers to place a wreath at uh, a veteran or dependent of a veteran's um, uh, grave site at these locations. Um, and on the surface, that's, that's what it appears. But when you delve into it a little bit deeper, it really comes down to a lot of factors. You know, the, the, the fact that some families, this may be their first holiday season without their loved one. Uh, this season has a tendency of being a very impactful time of year for many of us that have worn the uniforms because we were away from our families during the holidays, during birthdays, during anniversaries. So it's an opportunity for us to, to really remember those sacrifices made again um, during those periods of time. Um, and it really is an opportunity for families to gather, share stories again of their loved one, you know, whether it be mom or dad or brother or sister, and um, um, have that that opportunity to to have that event at a very what we consider to be a very sacred memorial spot um, to congregate and to celebrate those memories. Um, you know, again, both a celebration and a memory as we look at it. So. And having this ceremony, knowing the fact that uh, many of these uh, families are going through this emotional uh, time uh, for all the factors that you just mentioned, but knowing that other people and other families are going through those same emotions, how does that help kind of bring everybody together? Well, I think it's a healing process. You know, whenever we have the opportunity to gather together with, with, with families or friends or the public that um, maybe have similar experiences. It allows that natural empathy that we hope exists out there and that we, we fortunately see to, to really come to the forefront. Um, I had a, a story recently shared with me here, one of our, our fallen comrades that's interred out here. Back in 2014, there was a, uh, an article that this veteran had written that was in a, a large paper in the area and it talked about his time in Vietnam and specifically Christmas Eve in Vietnam that year and how a young private from Arkansas pulled a harmonica out of his pocket the night of Christmas Eve and played quietly two versions or two, two rounds of um, Silent Night. And this story again came out in 2014, Christmas Eve actually, as chance would have it. A local harmonica player reached out to that veteran that night and over the phone asked if he could play 
silent night twice for him over the, the phone. And that happened. Um, unfortunately, this harmonica player never met this veteran because this veteran passed in 2016. And we just were informed that this harmonica player had now reached out to the family and asked if they could meet out here at this wreath placement this year. And after the wreath was placed, play Silent Night for that family two times in honor of their loved ones. And that story that goes back to 2014. So you've got complete and total strangers that found a bond many years ago. And now at an event like this are finally having the opportunity to sit down together, to meet in person, share memories. And again, these type of stories happen out here on a daily basis. Um, and yes, we've got families that participate in this event, but this is open to anyone. This is open. There is no state line when it comes to our location. You know, we hear a lot of stories in the news where state lines are factors in various things and, and boundaries have to be. There is no state line. When we were in service, there was no state line. We served with people from across the nation, small towns and big communities together of, of all cultures, all races, all religions, all creeds. And I consider events like this a truly inclusive opportunity for us to do that same thing. So you don't have to have a family member here to participate in this replacement. You don't have to have contacts to Preston or this area. Um, anyone is welcome to come up here and join in this day. Anyone is welcome to come up and volunteer and place a wreath uh, in front of some of the veterans whose family maybe cannot be here, you know, for the event. Um, so we definitely encourage it. And, and I think, again, it's, it's a real opportunity, similar to Memorial Day, similar to Veterans Day, similar to Armed Forces Days, that we can take a moment from our busy, hectic lives and say, thank you. And even look at somebody and say, hey, your, your family member here has this on their monument. Can you tell me about that? What does that mean? You know, it, it's an opportunity for it to, to continue. And, and I think a message we commonly say out here is no veteran truly ever dies as long as they're remembered by a grateful nation. And, and, and that memory are those stories. That, that memory is that ongoing conversation that events like this provide to us and our families. I think you bring up an interesting point. Uh, I think nowadays sometimes uh, we're a little scared and maybe a little timid as a society to ask uh, families about their loved ones that have passed, uh, ask families about uh, what they did, what this means, what that means. And keeping those stories alive is so, so important. And events like this uh, kind of create that openness uh, between the uh, families that are missing their loved ones and those that are genuinely interested in the service they gave to this country. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I tell people that we're a cemetery out here, but I like to think that our monuments at these locations are actually a book that exists in that field out there. And it's our opportunity and obligation to open that book and find out that story. Um, we have things like our Veterans Legacy Program that families are welcome to join at these locations where they can go to this national site and register stories of their loved ones and pictures and those type of things out here. We have these local opportunities that, that family members can tell, you know, great grandma can tell the great grandchildren about grandpa. Maybe they met him, maybe they didn't. Um, Maybe great grandma served in World War II, you know, with the United States Navy and the grandkids have never heard that story. Again, it, it, it's an opportunity to ask those questions in, a, in, in my mind, in a very welcoming, um, honorable memorial location um, and maybe have some conversations that we, because of time, um, because of our hectic lives have never been able to sit down and unfortunately have. And now's the chance that we can have some of those conversations. I know this ceremony is taking place in Preston, as well as the three other veteran ceremonies uh, around the state of Minnesota on Saturday. How long has the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs held this specific Christmas wreath laying ceremony? Um, this ceremony has been around, as, as, from what I recall, from the time that we had our first 
State Veterans Cemetery in, in Little Falls. Um, it, um, it has expanded over the years. Um, we're fortunate that we work with two different uh, entities uh, that provide wreaths. So we're able to place a wreath at every single grave at our locations and across the nation. That isn't always the case, unfortunately. Um, but we're fortunate to do that. Um, but for ours, we've had it every year out here um, that we've been open, uh, even during the COVID years um, where we unfortunately were not able to gather as volunteer groups. Um, we as a team, you know, did the placement ourselves to ensure that we can honor those families until we could gather together again. Um, so, so again, very fortunate out there that we've had one every year in some sort of fashion. What time will the ceremony begin on Saturday? The ceremony uh, begins at 11 o'clock. Um, we do encourage families to show up or visitors to show up, you know, by 1045, um, give or take. You know, it's going to be a very mild day from what we're looking at. Um, so it, it will not be something where our face will hurt as much when we're out there this year as what it's happened in the past. But um, 11 o'clock, the service starts. It is a, a fairly brief ceremony that we have out here and and the reason it is you've got events like memorial day those are based on the cer ceremonies those are based on the speakers and the musical selections and and those type of things to us this is really about placing that wreath at their loved one's final resting spot that that again we've been you know tasked with the mission of taking care of and looking over through all time um, so we want to get those families out there to those grave sites and, and to allow them to do the placement as early as we can. So typically 15 minute, give or take ceremony, um, a quick briefing that we, we tell family the, the process of it, even the placement of the wreath is somewhat ceremonial when we do it. So we explain to families how the wreath is placed and, and what to do um, at that point in time. And then we allow families to depart first so that if a family has a loved one there um, or a battle buddy or somebody that I served with, they have the opportunity to do that placement of their, the one that they're there to pay respects for. And then any of our remaining volunteers are released after that so that we can go out and ensure that all of those are placed. Um, so again, strangers here um, eight years ago that have come back every year um, with the exception of our COVID period um, and have become that foster family for some of those veterans that maybe don't have someone here. It just is a, a really unique and special time and um, we, we appreciate the opportunity to do this every year. Anything we're missing? Anything else you want to pass on regarding this event or uh, anything else uh, going on uh, related to uh, the Veterans Cemetery in Preston? Um, I, again, I just want to really emphasize that these type of programs are intended for anyone. Um, it says Minnesota State Veterans Cemetery. I understand that. But again, there is no state line. There is, the river does not separate this location from Wisconsin. Um, anyone that served, um, that received a, a, a discharge of an honorable character is eligible to utilize these services up here. And anyone that wants to take a, a break from the hectic busy lives that we, we lead from the holiday shopping and the specials that are going on right now, this is a great opportunity to do that, to take a few minutes of time, put that busy, hectic schedule aside, sit down and think about the sacrifices these men and women have made over the years. And, and again, to me, this is a big kickoff for the holiday season. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a bah humbug uh, when it comes to it, but there's certain things that get me in, in place. Army Navy game is one of the things. And then this is really the, the culmination of it for me. So, um, it, you know, it, it, it's a great opportunity for people to come out here and maybe find that that holiday spirit, that that special opportunity to gather together. So, well, based on your last statement, uh, like the Grinch, I can see your heart growing when you're talking about those. You know, things. it's at least four times bigger just talking to you today, Darren. You know, so <laughs> well, it's a win-win. So, 
Exactly. Uh, Rob, we appreciate you say, taking some time to talk about the Aretha uh, ceremony coming up this Saturday at the Minnesota State Veterans Cemetery in Preston. Uh, thanks for uh, the time. Thanks for all you do for area veterans. And uh, most importantly, Merry Christmas to you and your family. I appreciate it. You take care of yourself and it's always a pleasure. Rob Gross from the Minnesota State uh, Veterans Ceremony, 11 a.m. Saturday morning, a wreath laying ceremony. Special event uh, coming to the community of Cresco next week. Uh, there's a, a new series uh, out uh, called The Duel, a, a 19, uh, I believe, 86 uh, duel between uh, Iowa and Iowa State uh, with uh, plenty of big names from the uh, world of college wrestling. And uh, that series is going to be making its way to Cresco next week. And here to talk about it is Jason Passmore with the Cresco Chamber and uh, Howard County economic development and uh, Jason uh, tell us uh, about what uh, will be taking place next Monday and Tuesday night in Cresco. You bet Darren I appreciate you uh, uh, chatting this up a little bit for us we um, uh, have been watching this from a little bit from afar and noticed that the duel uh, the six-part docuseries was making its way around oh the state of Iowa and just kind of previewing some of the episodes, maybe episode one, one time, episode two, another time. And they were getting a great response, but the closest they got to Northeast Iowa was maybe Waterloo. And we just thought Northeast Iowa loves wrestling. Um, and what if we took a different angle on it and we went ahead and showed the whole thing. There's six episodes. Let's show three on one night and three on the next night. And we floated the idea by the director and uh, he loved it. Uh, so we are going to do that on December 18th and December 19th. That's a Monday night and a Tuesday night at the historic Cresco Theater. Uh, so awesome place if folks have never been there. And it'll be a great night to, to relive one of the greatest duels of all time. And give us the history of the uh, duel for those that don't know. Yeah, you bet. I mean, uh, 86, I mean, you're, you're looking at... Uh, uh, just about the end of the, the Iowa domination run of their nine consecutive NCAA crowns uh, from a team. Dan Gable has, has already created the, the dynasty, um, and Iowa State's working their way back. And, and all of a sudden, 86 comes to, comes to pass. They've got a few ex-Hawkeyes on their staff, and you've got – I don't know what it is, four matches that are like the number one versus number two guys. Um, both teams are just absolutely loaded with defending national champions and, and going on to be national champions. Uh, it also is uh, Jim Gibbons' first year as head coach at Iowa State. He's all of 26 years old back then, uh, taking on the legend himself. Um and this docuseries, you know, goes through each and every match. Um, and there's a lot of Iowa, Iowa guys that, that came from Iowa that wrestle each other. Um, so some really cool matches and, and arguably one of the one of the greatest duels of all time. It was set in Ames. Um, so you had you had the entire sports world looking upon Ames on that day. And uh, from what I understand, uh, Monday and Tuesday night, you got some special introductions uh, happening as well. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, you know, after we kind of got the okay from the director to, to show the whole thing, um, he floated the idea of bringing Jim Gibbons and Dan Gable up. So we are um, super stoked to have uh, Jim Gibbons here on Monday night. He will introduce the film before we get her started. Um, and he'll stick around to answer questions and do whatever. Jim loves to talk wrestling and you see him on TV all the time. And then Tuesday night, Dan Gable will be up. And he'll do the same thing. He'll kind of give his introduction for the last last three episodes. Um, hopefully, we're, we're trying to make sure Dan brings a, a couple boxes of books um, so he can he can sign uh, sign some of his um, autobiographies there that he's got. Um, you know, I, I don't. Sometimes Dan only brings a box, so they go quick. But man, what a great uh, what a great Christmas gift if you haven't figured out what to get your wrestling fan is to get a an autographed book by Dan Gable. So. Those two guys are going to come up and, and help us out on these two nights. You know, it's just going to be a, a free will offering. We're putting this on as the Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame based here in Cresco. Um, as a nonprofit organization, we just love to promote the sport as much as we can. Um, 
And we just thought, you know, these guys have put a ton of effort. This is a first class film. Um, and what a better opportunity to come inside of a, of a historic theater and, and see what's going on back in the day of 86 when this, this was the talk of the nation. And the little bit I've seen of uh, the previews of uh, this docuseries, it also takes you a little bit back. I know uh, the media landscape is a little different uh, now than it was back then, but it also gets nostalgic on you and uh, really uh, brings out the deep appreciation that Iowa public television had in promoting college wrestling and kind of growing the sport uh, back in the day, uh, because a lot of this footage is from Iowa public television, from what I understand. Is that correct? Amen. Yeah. Um, that was probably when I was talking to the director here, um, John, John said that was probably the biggest hurdle that they had was just working with, with Iowa public television because they had all the filming. That's how we watched it back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if everybody remembers, that's how we watched the, the high school tournaments, uh, wrestling and boys and girls basketball and IPTV was, had all the rights on that. So yeah, there's a ton of footage from them. They were huge partners in this. Um, and then, you know, kind of like you're saying a little bit nostal nostalgic there, uh, there will be interviews back from then from the, the who's who of uh, broadcasting. Um, and so you'll get to see snippets from those folks that were doing that because you're right. We didn't have the whole social media craze back then. Um, so you, you had your three to four networks and that was about it. And, and everybody knew who the, who the head cheese was for broadcasting out there. So that's kind of cool. And uh, you mentioned, uh, obviously, uh, anytime Dan Gable shows up at a wrestling event, uh, that brings a crowd. That brings uh, a lot of people uh, from the wrestling world. And, of course, Jim Gibbons coming up Monday night. Uh, there's always that special connection he has to Howard County. You bet. Jim always loves coming up here. And both these guys serve on the Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame Selection Committee, um, which goes a long way when we let people know that they got inducted, um, when they know that Dan and Jim were part of the selection crew. Uh, but yeah, Jim's uncle, uh, Joe Frank, is from Cresco. Uh, he spent a ton of time up here. That's really the person that that got him hooked in the wrestling. And, you know, him and his brother, his brother was a four-time state champ. Uh, so that Gibbons family runs deep in wrestling. And they were spending a lot of their days and younger, uh, younger years up here in, in Howard County in the Cresco area. So Jim's a huge champion of the Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame. Uh, so, so excited to have him up here. And Dan is too. I mean, you give Dan a platform to uh, talk about wrestling and to further uh, advance the sport. He's going to do it. Uh, he doesn't even ask when or what, you know, he just, yep, I'm there. And so Dan will be up here and, and uh, those two guys, phenomenal uh, champions of our sport. And uh, you mentioned uh, the presentations uh, begin uh, at 630, uh, both Monday and Tuesday night. When do the doors open? Thank you, Darren. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the filming will start, the films will start at 6.30 um, after the introductions. Um, uh, we will have full concessions because, um, you know, three episodes is, is going to be close to three hours. Um, maybe a little less here or there, depending on how fast we can move them through there. Uh, doors will open an hour early. Uh, if you want to talk to Jim on Monday or Dan on Tuesday, so you get a chance to do that. So 5.30 doors open, show start at 6.30. Um, and like I said, Jim will hang around even afterwards and, 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 you know, talk to folks about what happened. We're also hoping that, um, we haven't got it confirmed because we're working day to day here, but we're hoping some of the other participants that were in that, that great match wow. might even make their way up here. So that would be really cool. Well, we'll, uh, call that a tease and, uh, hopefully it comes to uh, fruition. Uh, anything we're missing, anything else, uh, you want to pass on, uh, about next Monday and Tuesday night, Jason? No, I, you know, it's, it's, um, I know it's an odd time on a Monday and a Tuesday evening. Um, the docuseries will, uh, be available online for streaming, um, after the holidays here. So this is kind of a one of a kind. This is the only time that they're showing and, and, uh, we're putting together the entire series, uh, on a big screen. Uh, they've only teased it out there with episode one or episode two. Uh, so they are really uh, allowing us up here as the Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame to to premiere this thing before it's available through streaming services. So we're very appreciative to the duel uh, and hope that we fill the fill the historic theater. All right. Uh, give us the final who, what, where, when and why about the duel 
coming to the Cresco duel. This so week. at the Cresco Theater Monday, December eighteenth, and Tuesday, December nineteenth. Show starts at six thirty. Get there early. Doors open at five thirty. Jason, appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, tell us about a, a very special event uh, coming to Cresco uh, next week. And uh, thanks for the uh, time, as always. Most importantly, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Happy holidays, Darren. Thank you. Jason Passmore from the Cresco Chamber and Howard County Economic Development. The Duel going to be showing at the Cresco Theater next Monday and Tuesday night. For the final time in 2023, we're having a conversation with Decorah City Manager Travis Gedkin. And as you Look at the calendar year as a whole, and I know uh, from a uh, budgeting standpoint, uh, it's fiscal year, uh, July through June, but looking at the calendar year as a whole, in your mind, Travis, uh, what was the main positive uh, out of the business side of the city of Decorah here in 2023, and what are maybe uh, some of the challenges that the city is going to have uh, as we start 2024? Mm -hmm. So I'd say, Darren, probably the single largest uh goal achieved for the city of Decorah uh, is in relation to the school district and that land swap with the city's acquisition of the Dalen property uh, set to close here next week and the sale of city-owned property to the school. That That's going to mean so much to this community and was a goal uh, set by council that uh, it, was a, it was a larger lift than some might think, but uh, we're able to check that off the box and to piggyback onto that, you know, looking forward to 24, you know, we still have got to get uh, a little bit of a gap there on the cost to construct new uh, ball fields out at the Dalen property. And so uh, we'll be working to secure additional funding for that and getting the rest of that uh, project wrapped up in 24. That's going to be the biggest challenge looking forward. And when it comes to the sales of all these uh, properties, uh, where is that process officially at right now? And I know when you're uh, dealing with public land, sometimes you can't really uh, tell us everything about that. But uh, where is that process at? How close is the city to finalizing everything and dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's? Mm -hmm. So the city school land transaction, that's actually already finalized. Uh, that closed uh, last month, actually, and it's that one moved at lightning speed from uh, announcement to closure. We moved very quickly on that, and uh, that, of course, resulted in funds available for the city to make the purchase of the Dalen property, and we are set to close on that uh, on or before Friday of next week, I believe. And that's a, a pretty good uh, speed on uh, that end of things, and I know uh at the last council meeting, there was a resolution approving a plat of the survey of the Dalen property. Was that just part of the formality process of uh, the purchase of that property? Correct. Yeah. You know, anytime somebody wants to segment off a parcel uh, here in the city limits, not just in Decorah, anywhere, uh, a city needs to approve a plat of survey. It's kind of like a subdivision light, if you will. So it creates the legal borders and the abstract can be updated. I know uh, in January you'll get going with the uh, budget uh, process as you uh, get the things uh, going for uh, July 1st of uh, 2024 when the new fiscal year starts. And there's definitely some changes related to property tax reform, related to the state's restrictions on your ability to uh, collect uh, money. How big of a challenge is that going to be as you get ready for uh, the new fiscal year, uh, July 1st? Well, I'll have a better picture after January 1. Uh, the county, that's the statutory requirement for the county to give us our evaluations and the numbers we're going to be using uh, to establish our baseline, what our taxable value will be. I'm sure Ben's already working hard on it. He might even have it ready to go. And uh, then I'll have a better picture. But if I use historical figures for the city of Decorah, you know, we're averaging growth around 3.1% in taxable valuation. <clears throat> and based on that uh, property tax reform that you spoke of, Darren, that's going to put Decor in what's called a tier two classification. So uh, we're looking at a limit of additional revenues from property taxes within our general fund and our emergency levy of uh, basically 1.1%. You got to take a 2% haircut, as it's being called. Uh, off of that 3.1 being in a two uh, tier two city. So 
things things were rough last year. You know, I don't think this year is going to be any easier by that means. And when you have less revenue coming in and you're looking at the budget and things that you can do and you can't do, uh, is it a case of uh, really everything that needs to be considered on the table right now? How do you balance your needs, your desires, your wants, what's necessary and what right now uh, might not happen? Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything's on the table. Uh, Darren, you know, we start out with the first and easiest cuts are always going to be capital projects, whether it's replacing a piece of equipment or um, unfortunately it's sometimes cutting a, a maintenance issue that we're not going to make repairs. Uh, those are the easy ones. And then you start getting into programming type uh, cuts where it's uh, to offer this rec program, it costs the city a couple thousand dollars in the red. So we're going to have to cut that. And, um, you know, but only a couple thousand dollars, you got to make a whole lot of cuts to, to get to what these potential shortfalls might look like. And so, um, you know, by no means do we want to necessarily uh, talk layoffs and staff reduction at this point in time, but nothing's on the table, excuse me, nothing's off the table. Um, including maybe even we talk about reduction in services. Uh, maybe this building isn't open 40 hours a week. Um, maybe we look at a uh, four day work week here to reduce staffing hours and staffing costs. And it's all out there. We're looking at all of it. In terms of real dollars, and this might not be a, a fair question, uh, not having the specifics right now, but that 3.1 average growth and you're limited in uh, spending that at a 1.1% rate after that haircut uh, term that you just used in terms of real dollars, how much less is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, until I get those numbers from the County, I can't tell you exactly what that might be, but uh, if you bear with me for a second, I might be able to pull something up here. Uh, I like to keep keep a spreadsheet of. I don't know why I keep what it what it could have been if 2012 property tax law was still in place. You look at that, and it's uh sometimes it's saddening in this role. But uh, if you give me one second here, always good to have a spreadsheet uh, ready to go. So yeah, I should have had it ready to go. I should have anticipated a question like this, but. Here we go. So based on what our taxes have historically trended, um, a 3.1% increase in the valuation uh, would look like a increase to, let's see, from 300 and $81 million in taxable valuation up to uh, 391, excuse me, um, 391 is our, our current valuation. So 391, 684, 102 times 1.031, that's going to equal about 403,000 in valuation growth. However, when we start talking our general fund, our 810 levy, that now can only grow by about 1.1%. So where uh, that taxable revenue was 3,172,641. That would have been about an additional 100,000 increase from last year. So if I take that same figure, 3,172,641, give it its haircut. We're now looking instead at a potential growth of $16,000. So I've, in our eight a lot, fund, it? that's an extra $16,000 on top of last year. No, it does not go very far, you know, especially given you know, we've got a uh, union contract where employees' rates, uh, em employees' wages are going to be going up 6%. Uh, no math genius. That's why I use Excel. 
But uh, I, I know those two numbers, they don't work well with each other. So uh, it's, it's going to get tough. And how do you balance uh, everything uh, when it comes to all the needs, all the uh, requirements uh, that you have as a city right now and your limited ability mm -hmm. to uh, raise that revenue? And are there other uh, revenue sources that you can draw from knowing the fact that the property tax end of things uh, just isn't going to be what it used to be. Right. And that alternative revenue source has always been a topic of discussion. And, you know, everyone loves our tree tax, as people call it. But our, you know, our urban forest utility was a consideration based on last year's uh, tax reform discussions in Senate File 181, which was reduced uh, City of Decorah's uh, tax revenue by a little over 100000 last year. And so uh, we'll continue to look at alternative revenue sources that uh, that we can keep offering the services that we do today, but uh, we are gonna be hard pressed to continue to offer the same services without, uh, without that revenue. So I am kind of foreshadowing. I'm anticipating we're gonna have to drop some programs and services uh, moving forward. And when it comes to making these decisions, what type of a timetable are you on between getting that initial assessment from the county and ultimately filing the budget for fiscal year 2025? Mm -hmm. So statutorily, we're required to have that now completed by the end of April. Uh, staff has already been working uh, diligently on preparing expense estimates for fiscal 25. They'll get those into Carrie for uh, she'll put them all together. And then uh, I'll take a look starting. Uh, I'm going to take a little reprieve here between the holidays to gear myself up for coming back and taking a look at the the budget in front of me and uh, hopefully be well rested and able to take take on that challenge. In, in, uh, in that April date, uh, that used to be March, correct? Correct. That used to be March. Uh, now there are a few additional requirements based on that property tax reform. Uh, now the city, the school, the county, the three of us will have to hold. Uh, I don't know what the actual term they're calling it, but uh, I'm calling it the taxpayer statement hearing. So all of us are going to have to have a budget pretty much figured out uh, before March 15th, because we're all statutorily required now to submit to the county by that date what our potential budget's going to look like. The county then has five days to turn around a letter to every taxpayer in the county and send a letter on what those three entities' uh, current proposed tax bill might look like versus last year what it amounts to for percent increases, raw dollars, quite a bit of information, including all of our, what I'm calling taxpayer statement hearing dates and times. All three of us will have to hold this special hearing date. And then uh, after that hearing is held and the public has their opportunity to come and speak about the proposed budget, the council will then set another public, or excuse me, another public hearing on the budget. Uh, once that one is then held, then the city can finally adopt its its final budget. So that's why we have an extra month because of an extra hearing requirement. All right. Those were the two main uh, topics that I wanted to touch on. Uh, anything else uh, on your notebook uh, right now, Travis? You know, that's probably the single biggest thing we have coming up, of course, uh, budget season. Uh, that's going to be our focus. We do have a couple of open boards and commissions at this point. I believe uh, Human Rights Commission, uh, Tree Board, I believe, was just filled, tele telecommunications utility. You know, we're working hard and heavy on our fiber of the premises project. And so uh, getting that board position filled would, would be beneficial. So find out more information on those from the city's website. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. All right, Travis, we appreciate the update on uh, everything going on in the uh, city of Decorah. We'll probably have some very interesting conversations over the next uh, couple of months uh, based on this conversation this morning. Uh, 
obviously, uh, thanks for the time, as always. Most importantly, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Merry Christmas to you, Darren. Thank you very much. Travis Gedkin, uh, City Manager of Decorah. Having a conversation right now with Tim Cronin. He is the superintendent of schools in the Decorah Community School District. And Tim, a couple of the issues uh, that will focus the conversation on here this morning. Uh, one of them, earlier this week, the uh, school board met, and one of the topics of discussion was the Decorah District Agreement with Mabel Canton regarding uh, primarily kids in the northern part of Wenashe County and their ability to, to attend classes at Mabel Canton. Give us the history of that agreement. Give us where that agreement is at right now, and give us the Decorah District's perspective on whether or not that agreement should continue. Uh, so the history, uh, there, there, of course, is a long history there, uh, uh, going back to even before North Wynn existed as a school district about where people in the rural parts of the county would would go if they attended high school. Um, but the recent history has been that when the Mabel Canton, uh, or excuse me, the North Wind District uh, merged with the Decorah School District, um, there were students that were North Wind students that were going to Mabel Canton at the time. And the board uh, came to a, an agreement, a student um, enrollment agreement that would allow Iowa students to uh, graduate or go continue to go to school at Mabel Canton. So the agreement at that time was with the Decorah School District and the Mabel Canton School District. And that was five years ago or four and a half years ago. At the time, the board looked at uh, a couple things. Um, they wanted to let the students that were at uh, Mabel Canton finish their high school. And so uh, that's why they came up with five years. They, you know, four years plus a little uh, cushion, but they wanted to give those those students an opportunity to finish high school. Um, and so, in reviewing the board notes at the time, they uh, the Decorah board anticipated uh, in counting that it would be about fourteen students. Uh, what it what it's been is about of 30 students that uh, uh, Iowa residents that live in the northern part of Winnesee County go up to Mabel Canton uh, for school. Um, and so I know the board was a little surprised by that number, but the idea was that uh, this was a five year to get everybody through the high school. Um, but of course, uh, um, you know, the perception on that, the Mabel Canton folks would like it to, the folks in the Northern part of the County and the, they go to Mabel Canton and the, the Mabel Canton folks would like it to continue. Uh, the board, uh, the discussion that the board had on Monday was just kind of a review of the decisions that were made five years ago and how uh, unless it's uh, renewed by January 15th of 2024, then it will expire in uh, June of 2024. Um, I can say the, the, the unique parts of this is it allows students that live in the northern part of Winnesee County to attend Mabel Canton. Uh, if you're familiar with that, um, depending on what route you take, Mabel's about two miles, uh, three miles from the border. So Mabel is a lot closer to ho uh, homes in Iowa than homes in Minnesota would be to Decorah. So it's a one-way agreement where uh, students uh, in Iowa can attend um, school in Minnesota. Regarding uh, that agreement, uh, when it comes to dollars uh, that get transferred from the Decorah District to the Mabel Canton District over the past five years of this agreement, uh, on average, uh, how much money per year does the Decorah send up to Mabel Canton regarding this group of students? Uh, uh, De Decorah sends, uh, uh, depending on the year, the number of students, and it's been anywhere from, I think, about uh, 33, 34 to 27, maybe about uh, $200,000. I think we anticipate sending $191,000 up to the Mabel Canton School District this year based on the 27 students that are enrolled there. And is that money based on Iowa per pupil student uh, spending or Minnesota per pupil student? That's spending? Minnesota per pupil spending. So the state of Iowa funds each student at seven 
thousand six hundred and thirty five dollars and Mabel I don't have this number memorized but Mabel bills us seventy seven thousand one hundred and twenty five something along that so there's about a four hundred and ninety four dollar difference per student that decor actually is allowed to keep um, so that's roughly about thirteen thousand uh, dollars in this agreement in the decor from the decor district's perspective uh why should this uh, agreement sunset well i i you know it's, it's certainly a very emotional issue for folks um i feel uh in working with the board you know that was one of the first things that when i came on as superintendent a year and a half ago uh the board was like you know that agreement's going to expire um and uh we extended it so those students could finish high school um, but rather than kick the problem or kick it down the coat, kick it down the road, uh, it does need to, to end. So that was kind of one of the discussions we had when I came on. Um, from the decorous standpoint, um, we would uh, not want to be in any agreement that makes it easy for students to leave our district, especially if there's not reciprocity in that. Um, the state of Iowa does have open enrollment and we students are allowed to go to Alma Key or Howard Wynn, but that's a two-way street where they're allowed to, uh, you know, they can go out from Decorah or they can come back in. Um, but in this agreement, it's a one-way agreement that there the benefits, there's not a benefit to the Decorah School District in this this agreement. So, you know, the financial impact and, and I, we all have to look at finances because we have to have funding to stay Stay solvent. Uh, that's important to the school district. The the board, uh, I know I heard the board members talk about how they're elected to represent the best interests of the entire school district. And uh, they feel, you know, again, from a discussion five years ago where they said, let's extend it so these students can finish high school. Um, they felt like they've done that. And one of the things looking at it from the outside looking in is it the mere fact that there's a state line between these two school districts uh, is that the complicating factor oh yeah absolutely yeah um if there wasn't a state line then it would just be treated like open enrollment um and uh since it since it does i mean uh that's for sure the the biggest difference here in Moving forward, uh, these uh, 27 uh, students, I believe uh, the number was mentioned at last night's meeting, 17 right now are 7 through 12 and 10 are elementary. Would there be an option to just focus on those 27 students right now, or does the state uh, code not allow you to piecemeal like that? Yeah, so that was something they looked at five years ago was could we just grandfather in? Could we just let the the students that are in – Mabel finish Mabel and the way uh, the language on the agreement, I, I'm trying to get us, you know, uh, verify this opinion, but what uh, was told five years ago was you either have to be, it either has to be a yes or no. You either have to have an agreement in place and then anybody can do it, or you don't have an agreement in place and no one can do it. So there's not an option to uh, grandfather students in, unfortunately. Would the students have an option to go to Mabel uh, even if this agreement ends? And what would that option be? So the, the options for the students to go to Mabel and a lot of the uh, parents and students expressed a desire to do that. Um, they could they could tuition in and pay tuition to go to Mabel. Um, uh, last night, not something I'm super familiar with, uh, but uh, they could establish an educational guardianship with someone that lives in the Mabel Canton School District. And that was mentioned last night by uh, at least one or two of the Mabel speakers. Um, I've had people say that they're looking to move uh, to the Mabel Canton School District so they can attend school there. Um, that, you know, uh, somebody also indicated that they reached out to legislators and we're going to get, uh, see what they could, if, you know, the law could change. I, um, you know, we had a pretty big change with the state law with, ESAs last year. I don't know if this would uh, be something the governor would push, but uh, um, right now there's no provision for it uh, in state legislature. It has to be an agreement that's that's I mean, has to be approved. You have to have reciprocity between the two states, and then you have to have the individual agreement in place between the two districts. Interesting uh, conversation, uh, multi-layered conversation uh, with that agreement, and uh, there's a lot of factors, and we appreciate the breakdown on that end of things. Now, 
Moving on to a potential uh, new uh, needs regarding the elementary uh, facilities uh, here in the Decorah District. Uh, and you've gotten all the land uh, deals uh, taken care of to potentially move forward with a bond issue a little less than a year from now. Let's focus on uh, what the needs are and the needs for improvement are specifically related to uh, the John Callahan facility and the West Side facility. Yeah, we're kind of, uh, we're uh, starting to work with uh, uh, Nick Hildebrandt with Emergent Architecture. Um, one of the things, uh, we're pretty uh, focused in, we know what our needs are. Um, this isn't like uh, needing to do a facility review kind of thing. We know which buildings um, are needing to be replaced. We've known that for many years because we've already looked at that. So at that time, it's just a matter of how are we going to replace West Side and John Klein? Currently, those buildings serve pre-K through two. Um, there was a discussion prior to me getting here that maybe we'd put third grade in in the uh, in a new elementary facility. But based on how things are working, uh, space-wise, we're okay at the middle school, high school, as well as Carrie Lee. And so we're kind of moving forward at this point in time with the idea of a pre-K two building. Um, obviously, that is big enough to fit our enrollment needs with a little bit of growth, but not too big because we don't want to build a building and have empty space. Of course, excuse me. Um, we look at that. Um, if there's an opp opportunity to put a competition gym on that uh, uh, for our high school to be able to use, because it would be just right across the street, of course, that would be ideal. Um, the idea with a competition gym, then, you know, the elementary school has an indoor uh, area for PE class. We know one of the big deals now is the, uh, and I say gym, the uh, interior room that they use for the gym in the cafeteria, the gym, uh, gymatorium or gymateria uh, is, is one room and, and just having two spaces for, for lunch and for uh, PE class will be ideal. But uh, uh, building that uh, fits K through two, probably looking at five section with the ability to flex out to six sections as needed uh, with a uh, with a large enough gym for competition that would then also be used during the day for students would be awesome. And, and probably now that we have the whole island, we're exploring uh, having the tennis courts being located still on the Hively Island area. Um, just uh, exploring those. But we're in real preliminary, uh, just kind of like, what do we need? How does it fit? And we've got, uh, we'll be ramping up with a facilities committee that starts next month. They'll be working with Nick as we kind of guide and prepare some stuff for public consumption. I know you're preliminary, so this is probably a preliminary question, but I'll ask it anyway, because I don't think it's an unfair one. Uh, what happens to West Side in this scenario? You know, uh, uh, West Side is a, a building I'm sure the district would look to uh, get rid of. Um, it's it's uh, If somebody out there could spend the resources to uh get in and working order that'd be great but it, it is an expensive building to operate and it's an old building um and currently we just have head start and uh preschool in there so it's not used by very much in the district um so yeah that was preliminary I haven't really even talked to the board about that but i think that's the common knowledge is that the idea is that we uh replace our two oldest buildings with one new building that meets our needs and as of right now, uh, long-term plan, are you still thinking about the uh, November 2024 uh, potential bond referendum date? Uh, absolutely. Um, and that's uh, generally uh, school bond issues uh, may not fare as well in the November in the November presidential elections because there will be a, a big turnout. And, uh, um, but I don't know if I've seen that. I, that's maybe anecdotal. So, Absolutely, that's our that's our next chance to do a, a general obligation bond for a new school, and we're gonna we're operating backwards from you know having election November twenty twenty four, and what steps do we have to get in place to to meet that that target? And what are the earmarks? Uh, what are the dates to keep in mind uh, as you uh, 
work backwards, as you just mentioned. Yeah. So uh, I've just kind of was uh, on an email chain with uh, our architect and, uh, and the um, Gallagher group that's helping us. We'd like to uh, have some uh, information ready for public uh, dissemination late February, early March. So working backwards, we're going to have the facilities committee meet a couple of times this winter, get uh, start getting public input on, on specific drawings and kind of do some refining that sets you up for the end of the school year where you kind of have the summer to, you know, start explaining to people what the impacts of the, what the building's going to look like, the impacts on their taxes and get that information out so that you hit the back to school and you're ready to uh, be talking about it. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll do some stuff over the summer, but uh, we'll also do stuff early in the fall with a, with the November election. That's, you know, you've got, all of September and October to have listening sessions and talk through the fine, final final parts of the plan. And I'm sure uh, we'll uh, talk about uh, many issues related to it uh, between now and then. Uh, those were the two main topics of discussion that I wanted to touch base with you. Uh, anything else uh, up your sleeve right now, sir? Well, uh, yeah, uh, lots of stuff going on right now. I think the other big uh, piece at the board meeting was uh, we had an opportunity to review for the board the process we used for uh, impl uh, implementation of Senate File 496, and that as it pertains to uh, library books, that's the one that uh, I think people have heard a lot about, uh, especially at the start of the school year. I think uh, maybe Urbandale announced that they were going to pull 60 to 70 books off their shelves. And then I think a week later, they said, oh, maybe it's not 60 or 70, maybe it's 40 or 50. Um, regardless, there's been a, um, a committee that's met and reviewed that. We've kind of been looking at our collection, uh, frequently books that are removed. And uh, we could tell that the Des Moines Register has put out a database of all their uh, Freedom of Information Requests Act. Uh, about books that other districts have pulled off their shelves. And it was pretty obvious that, that like a couple books just were on everybody's list. Like, oh yeah. And so then you're wondering uh, the state law, uh, the reason that books should be, have to be removed is for sexual content. Um, and uh, that's, you know, some books uh, maybe have been removed in the course of, you know, whether they be banned books or whatever. And it's not based on necessarily sexual content. It might be thoughts or ideas um, that communities haven't uh, uh, thought were appropriate. So our task was to look at the books and a committee of five or six, and then uh, verifying whether uh, we, whether it met, met the criteria to remove from shelves. So that committee actually took the books, read the books, put sticky notes on it, came back, Matt said, yeah, this is, these are the questionable sections that meets the criteria for definition of sex act. And we removed it from our shelves. Um, I want to say, and I looked this up last night, it's about a list of about 26, 28 uh, titles. Um, you're going to see those numbers be all over the place um, for lots of different reasons. I think it's some of it, which it starts with, how many books do you have in your collection to start with? Um, how do you attack the process? If you just pull a, if you just take your list of books and say, what book should I not have on my shelf? You're going to have a much bigger list than, than, than we did. Um, this group, uh, I'll tell you what, the process for this was, this was not something that was taken lightly or uh, uh, was taken very seriously. And so we feel real good about the process. We also understand that it's a fluid process and, and uh, you know, book lists might change. There's currently two lawsuits challenging uh, this and uh, uh, going on right now, but uh, we had to be compliant or need to be compliant by January 1st. And so that was uh, the mission of, of last uh, Monday's work with regards to that. And did you have to document uh, what you did to be in compliance with the state law? You know, uh, we didn't. We uh, we're, we're not required to do that with the state. We do have a freedom of information request with the Des Moines Register, so we'll we'll get our press release out and and do that. And so then we'll be part of the the Register's database. And if you haven't looked, they 
they, it keeps growing and gets getting updated. And as almost a de facto reporting agency, that's what uh, the Des Moines Register has become on this topic. Great, uh, Tim. We appreciate the uh, catch up of uh, what's going on in the uh, Decora Community uh, School District. Thanks for the time, as always. And most importantly, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you very much. Tim Cronin, uh, Superintendent of Schools in the Decorah Community School District. Thank you to our guest on the program, Rob Gross from the Minnesota Veterans Cemetery in Preston. A wreath-laying ceremony will take place Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, and that ceremony is open to the public. And it's going to be a nice day uh, from what it sounds like on Saturday. So uh, great opportunity to uh, thank those that uh, gave so much so we can have so much as well. Jason Passmore from the Cresco Chamber, uh, a docu-series, The Duel, focusing on the 1986 Iowa State Wrestling Duel, one of the greatest duels in college wrestling history, and that's going to be on the big screen next Monday and Tuesday night at the uh, Cresco Theater in Cresco. Jim Gibbons going to be there Monday night. Dan Gable going to be there Tuesday night. Uh, the event is being put on by the Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame. Free will donation to uh, get into uh, that event. And appreciate Jason joining us to give us all the details on that one. I thank uh, Decorah City Manager Travis Gitkin and also the Superintendent of Schools in Decorah, Tim Cronin, for joining us on the show this morning. Don't forget, we put these shows on YouTube for you where you realize you're a busy person, especially during the holiday season. Can't always be near a streaming device or a smart speaker or a radio at nine o'clock on a Thursday morning, but we get to talk to interesting people and we want to bring these interesting conversations to you on your schedule. Head to YouTube, a 1214 Our Town program, a great way to look it up. And we also put the link up on all of our LA Communication Facebook pages. Another way we keep in touch with your communities here at LA Communications. So thank you to our guest. Thank you to our sponsor, Decora Bank and Trust in most importantly, we thank you, that's right, you, for tuning in, for logging on, and for watching our town on 94.9 and 99.1 The River.